Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. I have the great honor this afternoon of talking with Maxine Wolf, who is a lesbian pioneer, activist, um, former university professor, I believe you're distinguished. Um, and you've been involved with the movement in a million capacities for a long time. So I'm, I'm very honored to have you here. Let's it's start. My, with it's my honor, actually. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. And I hope this will be the first of many interviews because we have a lot to cover. Um, I'd like to start with your bio, if I may, a little bit. You grew up in working class Jewish immigrant, in a working class Jewish immigrant household. You went to Brooklyn College um, and you started college at 16 and graduated at 19. Right. That's illustrious. Um, According to this dubious source I have, Wikipedia, it was in college that your political interest was sparked and you worked at the Brooklyn Congress of Racial Equality, Brooklyn Core, when you were in college. Is that correct? Well, not that's that's part of that Wikipedia that was a little weird. <laughs> the whole thing I actually got interested in po politics when I was younger. Um, because the classmate of mine in high school took me to see Pete Seeger um, when he was blacklisted and they sang this land is made for you and me and I said that's right and that was it. Um, seriously, the, the power of music. Um, and um, when I was in Brooklyn College, uh, I tried to join CORE. I went to some meetings and they were doing work up here um, in Brooklyn, a lot of stuff about uh, poverty and other stuff. Um, but it was also at the point where the movement itself was changing to be uh, uh, all black, you know, where the split was happening and people wanted to run their own organizations. And, and so that I stopped, uh, you know, doing that. I just did all kinds of odd other things. Um, but um, I would say my first um, small um, um, uh, action, you know, street action was trying to unseat the Mississippi delegation to the Democratic Convention in 1964. And I w went out on street corners trying to get people to sign a petition. And that, you know, almost everything you do when you do something like that, um, adds to your political perspective. And I went up to a, a postal worker who was getting out of his truck. And I said, would you sign this um, petition to stop the, you know, to change the Mississippi delegation so that it reflects people in Mississippi. And, um, and he said, I don't sign anything. And I said, what? And he said, McCarthy's not dead. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, so so you learn everything. So anyway, I, I consider that sort of a, uh, my um, induction into being on the street, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as opposed to being in meetings and and just doing some pickets. You know, I did some stuff about the Krugerrand and South Africa. You know, a lot of small things. But well, one of your critiques is that a lot of political movements. Um, rely on leadership to speak for the membership and they don't really get out to um, talk with the actual people who are involved in the group whom they're supposed to be representing. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. Um, Sorry for the digression, yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> well, to, to continue with your bio, you went on to, uh, after Brooklyn College, you went on to obtain your master's and PhD in psychology. You're a professor emerita in psychology from the Graduate Center CUNY. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I remember 
Um, my first question, because I taught for 30 years myself, and I used to say to myself, my scholarship is my activism. And Lillian Faderman, I'm echoing her, it's not, but um, so my first question to you was going to be, how did you find time with a demanding teaching load to do all this activism? Um, I don't know. I just did it. <laughs> I had, and, I, and I had two kids besides. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I think that uh, for me, my job, my teaching was a job. I was good. I was good at academic work and it paid my salary and it gave me time off, like in the summers and stuff. And I could even arrange my hours of teaching because <clears throat> I, well, for eight years when I was a, a graduate student, I taught part time, but then I was teaching full time and um, and I just, I could arrange which courses I would teach because I was in a graduate school, you know, very elitist kind of um, position. And, uh, and that's what I did. And we used to joke because in, in ACT UP, we, we put out this women's, um, uh, women in AIDS book. And when we were working on it, um, we needed to dedicate it to somebody. And one of the things we dedicated it to was the CUNY graduate school because they let, you know, we did Xeroxing there, we had meetings there, you know, so in some ways we made it, we made it work. <laughs> and I did read a speech that you gave about academia and activism. And you said, you know, as a, an academic, I was much more privileged in terms of time than people working nine to five. Absolutely. Work and so that's a very useful perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you did a lot of things, and then um, maybe I'm wrong, but your first um, publicized action or activity involved the reproductive rights movement. Right. Involved in an organization uh, supporting reproductive rights. Yes. And I read another, I, I read part of an interview with you that said reproductive rights is a lesbian issue because um, it's about control of women's bodies. Right. But in any event, um, tell us a little, the, uh, your involvement with the reproductive rights movement resulted in the formation of a lesbian action committee. And that committee right. created some waves with, some, with the group that you were organizing with. Can you right. tell us about that? Right. Sure. Um, so I joined, um, I did a, a lot of different things, and then I ended up um, joining a group called CARASA, the Coalition for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse. And, uh, you know, it was, it was very, and it still is pretty unusual uh, to, to combine those things, but you have to combine those things if you understand that um, reproductive rights is about controlling your body and that there were many uh, poor women, women of color who were sterilized in exchange for an abortion. Um, and even in Puerto Rico, which has a huge number of women were sterilized, you know, not knowingly, but not knowing um, uh, because it, it, it was a way of, of controlling the population. So the difference between population control and, and abortion rights is something that people need to keep in mind. So I joined CARASA and I did a lot of different things in the organization. Um, I worked on a lot of different issues like daycare and things like that. And then a group of us uh, who were lesbians who were in the organization decided that we would start a lesbian action committee so we could do, you know, include uh, lesbian sexuality under reproductive rights. And, um, it there was a, it went on for a long time, but uh, the the conclusion is that there were many. The organization had or, organ um, was part of the Reproductive Rights National Network, which I helped start, which was like eighty different groups across the country. And when we produced information about lesbians, you know, like stickers and things, it was the least 
picked up thing that anybody did. Okay. And in, in, in the organization that we were in, Carasa, people saw it as, you know, typically uh, what happened sometimes with uh, that situation, uh, claiming that we were trying to make everyone into lesbians. And, um, and then when that didn't sort of work, um, people uh, basically questioned the kind of organizing we wanted to do. And I maintain that lesbians do very different, at least then, um, kinds of organizing with women because we're not, um, you know, it's not about necessarily your children or going to places where women would be with children. It's, it's about organizing unorganized women, okay? Not about organized women. And a lot of the groups that are more on the left and to this day, okay, that, that this group turned out to be more of a socialist feminist group and they were on the left and they, their mode of organizing was to get people in different organizations to endorse whatever they were doing. And so there would be one person in an office because they didn't have membership um, there would be one person in an office and they would get our met, you know, sign on to whatever we were doing, but they didn't have people to show up, you know, because they didn't have a membership. And our thing was, it was time to organize unorganized women and the best places to go would be places like hair salons, you know, laundromats, places where women are that they do not need to leave, you know, <laughs> that they're sitting there and they're reading a book or something if they're waiting for their laundry to get done. And it's a perfect time to talk to people. It's a perfect place to put literature out. Um, and that caused quite a lot of uh, problems. We also wanted to go to places that women don't usually, that organizations on the left don't usually go. So like when, when people would do or organizing they'd go to Greenwich Village well who needs to go to Greenwich Village we wanted to go to Flatbush okay which is an organization you know in Brooklyn a place in Brooklyn that nobody ever goes to and people started picking at us you know like nobody nobody's going to want you there but then when we went to King's Highway which is another neighborhood in Brooklyn women said to us you know with abortion stuff women said to us no one ever comes here except the Jehovah's Witnesses you know? <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's a way that people prevent themselves from doing, from going to places where they have an image in their head. When we went to Flatbush, which at that time had become a big Caribbean neighborhood, um, women came up to the table, just like everywhere else, to sign, you know, petitions for ab about maintaining abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And one woman I remember said, her daughter started saying, what are we doing here? Well, she said, shush, this is about your mother, you know, <laughs> okay. And so it didn't matter where we went there, because if you look at the statistics, you know that women of every background, women of every religion, women of every ethnicity support abortion rights, you know? And so you can't like limit where you go. Anyway, it ended up with becoming very, very difficult for us to stay in the group because people were actually, you know, under the guise of politics, pushing the lesbians out. So we started a group called Women for Women. <laughs> and um, we ended up doing most of our work at the national level with the, the Reproductive Rights National Network, which I had helped start. And, um, you know, some years before, and we ended up being on the um, you know, uh, national steering committee, a lot of us. Um, but that was sort of that. But I still, you know, I, I did did do work on abortion rights for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I still support it. And I, I actually support, you know, free abortion on demand, if you really want to know <laughs> where I stand. I just don't think that anybody should be able to tell you what to do with your body. Exactly. And let's I don't. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. Um, let's talk about women in ACT UP. Okay. You talk um, about two of the um, myths, the myths, the wrong myths about ACT UP. One, that Larry Kramer founded it, and two, <laughs> there are no women in it. 
So tell us about your involvement in Women in ACT UP. Yeah, well, um, Larry ended up being a good friend of mine. Um, and uh -huh. unfortunately, unfortunately, he passed away this year. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, so I was looking for something to do because in, in about 1980, to every group that I was a part of fell apart. <laughs> and uh, it was the Reagan era. And so I did, you know, individual kinds of actions. Um, I also had gone to early meetings of what was then GLAD, um, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, which is, um, you know, uh, still around. Um, and I didn't like it because it was very top down. And, um, but I, I knew that we had to do some work around AIDS, and which was interesting because there were women in the community that didn't understand why we were doing that. And uh, there was an, a newspaper in New York called Woman News, and um, some woman wrote in a letter saying, why, why are we doing this for gay men? You know, we should not be doing this for gay men. And so Joan Nestle and I, I, was, I, I had gone to the archives then in 1984, and Joan Nestle and I wrote a letter back saying, how many Nicaraguans do you know? <laughs> okay, because clearly it was like internalized homophobic stuff because you don't need to know somebody personally to work on an issue. It's you do it because it's something that's important to you, not because it's for somebody else. That's a, that's, I call that philanthropy if it's important for somebody else and not for you, but you know, if it's important, you know, you should work on it because it's important to you. And it was. So um, I also joined a group called uh, Lesbian and, CUNY Lesbian and Gay People from the graduate school, you know, from actually from all of CUNY um, to keep my hand in. And that June, I went to the Gay Pride March with the CUNY group and ACT UP was in front of me. And they had this amazing uh, concentration camp float. And I saw a couple of women and I went up to one of the women and I said, are there women in your group? And she said, oh yeah. So I went to the, for the meeting at the community center two weeks later and, um, and saw four visible women. <laughs> um, but that grew. And I mean, I, it, what kept me there was that it was, you could do what you want. You stood up and if you had a good idea, you could do it. It was so different from so many of the groups that I had been in on the left. Uh, even the women's groups where everybody, you know, had to agree on everything. And this was not that way. It, there was no general principle other than that we were trying to end the AIDS crisis. And if somebody came up and wanted to do something, you would discuss it. And if it passed the vote, you did it. And um, so I stayed and gradually, you know, more women came and I have never been able to be in a group where I don't know people. I, I find it very difficult to just do something abstractly and you know come into a meeting and never talk to anybody. So I invited a whole group of the women to come to my house, which was our first dyke dinner. Um, I still have a dyke dinner every year um, and um, with some of the most amazing activists you can possibly yeah. imagine. And um, and they and and young young women as well. So it's not just um, those of us who have been doing this a long time because we keep meeting people. And um, and we talked about that night. We talked about why we were in the group, like why as women, why as lesbians, we were in this group act up. And it was really interesting because people had different reasons. One woman's brother had AIDS. Other people didn't know anybody with AIDS. Okay, it was you know uh, I basically wanted to do the work and act up because I felt like the homophobia that was attached to to HIV and AIDS was enough to kill me. I mean, one day when I was walking across the street in Park Slope, uh, a woman yelled out, uh, "I hope you all die of AIDS." You know. I, it, it, in the world at large, people did not and often do not make the distinction between lesbians, gay men, trans people, or anybody else. As long as they think that you're in that category, that general category, they want you dead. 
Okay. So, um, so anyway, so we started a women's committee and actually the first action that we did solidified it because we, uh, so we had the diet dinner. We actually went away for a couple of weekends. We, you know, did things together to build a relationship to one another. And um, how many of you were there? Um, in that first grouping, about seven or eight, and then it grew. Um, so we were going to have a meeting to talk about getting women into clinical trials at the um, NIH, because to this day, it's really hard to get women into those trials, even though their bodies are very different than men's and they deal with medication very differently. Um, and so we, we were gonna have a meeting about what could we do about that? And uh, Rebecca Cole, who was one of the women, um, was on the way to the meeting and she passed uh, a, a newspaper stand and there was a magazine and on the cover, it was Cosmo, had a, 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 a headline about that, that heterosexual women do not have to worry about AIDS, okay? And she was fuming. She, so she, and it, she brought it up and it turned out that it was a male psychiatrist who had not done anything about HIV. And, um, but he had patients that he thought were anxious because of it. And he, he had an office on um, uh, East End Avenue, which if you don't know, New York is a very upper class area. And um, he wrote this whole thing that was totally racist about why there was AIDS in Africa, and um, uh, just uh, his major point was that women's vaginas ward off any infections, okay? Because they're so strong and resilient and um, whatever. And so what we did was we immediately said, let's do an action. And we did what, what people don't know this about ACT UP, but ACT UP had this as a premise. You first, you call up the people that you're, angry at and you ask to meet with them and you give them a chance to change their mind by talking with you. And then if they don't change their mind, you have the moral high ground to do an action, right? But if you could have changed their minds without doing an action, why bother to do an action? So we called up this doctor and he was so arrogant that he said, sure, you know, come and interview me. So we got to get, we got um, Denise Ribble, who was a nurse at the Community Health Project and had been seeing, had been running groups of women with HIV, okay, to come, and then a group of us. And we interviewed him and Jean Carlo Musto, who's a wonderful filmmaker, um, brought her camera and he was so arrogant that he said, fine. And so we filmed the entire thing. Um, and basically filmed him saying things like, you know, that uh, uh, women in Africa get HIV because their men take them in a rough way. And, you know, and so we would count to him at each point and say like, and rape in the United States, like, what is that about? You know what I mean? So we basically, um, you know, answered everything that he said and showed how ignorant he was. You know, when he said the thing about the vagina, we started naming all of the kinds of infections that women get, okay? And, um, and then we left and we basically decided that we would do an action at Cosmo because we did ask to speak to the people at Cosmo, but they didn't want it to speak to us. So um, we planned an action at the building. Cosmo had two buildings at the first Cosmo building, which was on 57th Street. And it was a freezing day. It was about six degrees in New York. It was in January. And um, we did this, we did a picket basically. And we were gonna try to get into the building. I actually had called um, to say that I wanted to bring a group of students up there who were studying the physical environment of magazines and magazine production. And um, we were gonna go. And then the day before somebody leaked a story about the action to one of the local newspapers, the Daily News, and they put it on their gossip page. And so they called me up to say that they weren't allowing any people up and I could make another date or something. So we went anyway, and we did a basically a picket and we kept trying to get into the building and we couldn't, they had, they had, uh, 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 you know, uh, 
goons out front is the only word I can think of to use um, and who kept pushing us back. And finally, we had picketed it long enough. We went, and, and by the way, the men in ACT UP totally supported this action and they were at it with us. Um, and then we, we decided we would walk over to the other Hearst building and which was a couple of blocks away, which is where they had put the barricades because they didn't realize we were gonna to come to this building. So we get to that building, walking very slowly. I always say, when you cross the street, do it with the light and go slowly, okay? And then, you know, you end up doing a minor action. And we got there and um, they made us be in these, this barricade and we were picketing. And then we said, no, nah, let's just go back to the other place. And, we didn't say that out loud. So I went to open up the, the barricade and a police person said to me, uh, oh, you can't do that. You need to be in there. And I just said, oh, we're, the, the demonstration's over. And he said, oh, and he opened it up for us. And then we started chanting and we went back to the other building. And by that time, the police were getting a little, you know, crazed. And so they arrested um, one of the women, Jerry Wells, who was doing it with us. And she had been protecting me because the police uh, really came after me because I kept challenging them. And so they picked her out as a way to end the demonstration. And they took her into the, uh, the police wagon that was there. And um, Maria Magenti got so upset because she couldn't get arrested, Jerry, because her brother was in the hospital and she had to go to the hospital. Um, he had AIDS. And so she, Maria, just without thinking, <laughs> climbed onto the trunk, the front of the, not the trunk, the hood of the, of the police wagon and started pounding on it and on the window and, and yelling, um, uh, let that woman go, let that woman go. And so then everybody in the action started, you know, screaming, let that woman go. And this lieutenant who was, we call them white shirts, who was in charge of the demonstration for the police, opened up the door to the uh, police wagon and went in and said, get that woman out of here because we're gonna have a riot. And so they wrote her like a desk ticket and you know, put her out and she came out and you know, did like a victory you know, sign and everybody applauded and stuff and the, and the action ended. So yeah, it ended, but it ended the way we wanted it to end. Um, and then yeah, it was an amazing action. Oh, and I should say it was the first time that ACT UP to my knowledge, uh, did not um, organize with the police. The other actions pr prior to the women's action, they had negotiated with the police a negotiated arrest. This was not, and, and they, one, one of those men kept yelling at me, the, the police lieutenant wants to speak with you. I said, we do not want to speak to the police lieutenant. <laughs> um, anyway, so that was an amazing action for a lot of reasons. And then we did follow up by uh, doing some a boycott of the, the magazine. And um, we were on several television programs and we got a lot of the word out, even if it didn't mean that they would change the magazine, but a few months later they did. And they had a different kind of article, but they didn't do it right away. But you, you never know how long it's gonna take for something to you know, show up. That's why it's important to keep doing your activism, even if you don't get an immediate result, uh, because you never know what's going on in the background. But what anyway, a, yeah, go ahead. What a fabulous story. And I've never heard about that. No, so. people, it's uh, interesting. People pick out actions that they think were important because they don't. I mean, the, the, I, there are many actions that we did were important, but I thought the importance of this one was that it was, un, you know, we did not negotiate with the police because it was the women who organized the entire thing because the men came with us. So it was definitely a supported action, um, which many people don't ever think of act up that way. Um, and uh, we always had men who supported the work that we were doing. Uh, men in my, we, we formed affinity groups, if people don't know what that means, it's a small group of people that when you do big actions and there's a lot of people there, it's a group that you do work with so that you know each other well and you can support each other. And often in ACT UP, those small groups did 
a specific thing that was not just the generic action. Um, but, you know, my affinity group had 24 people in it and most of them in, and several of them have died. And we did work all the time on women's issues, on changing the CDC definition of AIDS to include women. That was, you know, my affinity group really started that. And it was loads of men who, you know, were not going to benefit in the way that you think of benefiting, uh, but who were totally involved in it. Um, so it's something that people should remember about uh, ACT UP, you know, that there were many men who supported all kinds of actions. Everybody always thinks about drugs into bodies, but that's not at all the only thing we did in ACT UP. And, and it wasn't just the women, Women's Committee, although the Women's Committee um, is the only committee that wrote a book <laughs> uh, that was published on women and AIDS, and um, that was an actual published book. We also put together, um, uh, before that, that the book was based on, um, we used to do teach-ins at ACT UP, and we did a teach-in on women and AIDS, and you'd be amazed how important that was in a men's group where men had never seen a vagina, okay? Seriously, and, um, and didn't know like how women function or why it would matter what drugs they took, uh, you know, and, and we took that on to do and, um, and produced a, a, a thick book on women and AIDS that went all over the world because it, we, we sent it to people in other countries and, 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 and in future actions, those people came and supported a lot of the actions that we did when we went to international conferences. Uh, so we created an international, you know, uh, uh, um, network of AIDS activists by doing that kind of stuff. This is incredible. Clearly, this is the beginning of a much longer conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen before we let you go, are there any words for the audience that you'd like to share? But we do want to have you back and talk more. Okay. Uh, I, I do just want to say that. Um, one of the things that I was involved in was the lesbian Avengers who started the dyke marches. And we should talk about that some other time. Um, and I am a coordinator at the Lesbian History Archives, which I urge everybody to look at our website. There's amazing stuff on there. Tapes, videotapes, audio tapes, uh, photographs. Um, if, you ever, if we ever get you to come to the archives, that's great, but you can see a lot online. And what I want to tell people is get out in the street and do things. You know, and there's no, uh, I mean, people, there are all different ways to do activism, but I am a firm believer in direct action activism and being out there visible. And um, I always used to say <laughs> that it's okay if you get, if people are afraid of you, because that's when politicians do something. Um, but, and, and just one other thing, which is something I always say, and is important to remember, which is you have to have a vision. And, you know, my vision is of a world, a just world. And it's because that's my vision that I do the things that I do, because I want to be part of creating that. And if I'm not here to do it, the people that come after me will. Um, so Maxine Wolf, thank you for joining <laughs> us. So, thanks so much. Hello again. After we recorded this interview, I discovered that there is a Vimeo recording the action that Maxine spoke about in the interview, and I think it would be great to have a visual addition to her remarks. So I'd like to thank Director Jean Carlamusto for giving us permission to show Doctors, Liars, and Women, AIDS Activists Say No to Cosmo. Enjoy.
In January 1988, Cosmopolitan magazine published an article by Dr. Robert E. Gould called Reassuring News About AIDS, A Doctor Tells Why You May Not Be at Risk. According to Dr. Gould, there is almost no danger of contracting AIDS through ordinary, unprotected heterosexual intercourse. I'm very upset about your article, and I've already written Cosmopolitan because it infuriated me when I read it. I was in a monogamous relationship with one man for two years. I have problems that I will not go into because I, I cannot have anal intercourse. I am not an IV drug user. I'm, I go to the gym. I'm a faithful gym goer. I got it through ordinary heterosexual sex. What you're saying there is so misleading. That's nothing short of attempted murder. For every Cosmo lie, more women die. For every Cosmo lie, more women die. If you can transmit it heterosexually through penis-vagina intercourse, the numbers would be vastly greater than what we see. We literally mobilized within four days, um, starting with a review, a very quick review of the article in a three-hour meeting, which was held at my house with lots of food and drink, which was wonderful, uh, an introduction on a Monday night to the general body of ACT UP saying we want to do this and getting a lot of support from all the men in the group, which was very exciting. The whole movement. Um has very much addressed um, a lot of men's issues, and uh, you know, and, that, and that's been great. But I think that they that that there's been there needs to be some leadership now and some sort of uh, uh, in the media and whatnot in addressing the fact that women are at risk. We're not invisible in all this. So over the course of the next three days, one of the things that was happening is I was writing the flyer, staying up all night writing the flyer. Other women were spending the morning scouting the building of Cosmopolitan on West 57th Street. Uh, meanwhile, Jean was, uh, in her mind, brewing the idea of getting together with Dr. Gould and taping an interview with him where we could actually confront him and say, uh, you know, what, what, is, what, what do you think you're doing? I began thinking of ways to make it apparent to the viewer that uh, what the issues were. And to do that, I felt like we really needed to confront Gould. We needed to go and sit down with the little monster and find out exactly one by one uh, each issue he had presented that was putting women in peril. Can I just ask um, what the, uh, the, uh, your expertise in documentation and the AIDS, uh, as far as AIDS is concerned? I became concerned because as a psychiatrist, all of my patients were talking about AIDS and their fear of it. And what risk are they at? And should they be changing their sexual habits? And so on. In order to be able to advise them, if it's a deadly disease and was easily transmissible, it required a certain kind of approach. If there were distortions and misrepresentations, then it would be good to be able to uh, clarify that. So that's how I got interested in this. Con considering the kind of statements that you make in this article about your own assessment of statistics that you've re read and the work that you've done, why did you choose Cosmopolitan as the place to do this when you knew there would not be the possibility of substantiating some of your claims with the kind of footnoting and bibliography that is crucial to any kind of serious work on this it was issue? purely fortuitous. Myra Appleton with the article's editor, is a good friend of mine. She knows my thinking when we talk about things at dinner, one thing or another, and she said, you know, I think this would be a good piece for our readers. And I thought about Cosmo, and although I've never written for Cosmo, if what I'm saying is correct, it would be very useful for a lot of scared people whose lives are being compromised, if I am correct. You say, can I, recurrent sexual activity with a person who does carry the AIDS virus cause you to develop AIDS? Not if you subscribe to the theory supported by considerable fact, 
which I have just put forward, that you don't get AIDS from sexual activity with a man who has the disease or carries the virus unless you engage in anal sex or there is an open lesion in the vagina when you are having vaginal intercourse. That's wrong. How many women you think in the United States have a healthy vagina? That is one that has no cuts, no abrasions, no internal lesions. Um, no mild yeast infection. No mild yeast infection, no vaginitis, I, no chlamydia. I think, I think that I'm being conservative when I add lesions because I think in these small lesions, because many women have them, that again, that is not a mode of transmission because if it were, we would have thousands of more cases. Your data here that you put in a January uh, 1988 Cosmopolitan magazine and based all your theory on is one year out of date, a full one year. And in that one year, there have been I, somewhere around a thousand new reported ca cases of women heterosexually transmitted. That has left out an awful large portion of the numbers. So I would like to know why it's, it's one year behind and most of the things you're telling me is based on these numbers. I don't know that it's a year out of date. I know there are more people allegedly getting it, but it doesn't prove that it has happened that way. If I can even give some more of my data on this, and from some personal uh, examples from, from patients, I do know that there are women who have had anal sex who have not acknowledged it or admitted it. I've known women who practiced nothing but oral sex and they're HIV positive. I've also known women who practice nothing but heterosexual sex and even that over short term and are HIV positive. They're not drug users. They're not the sexual partners of drug users. They're not positive. They're not prostitutes, and they're not liars. Well, can I just quote from your article? Then, too, many men in Africa take their women in a brutal way so that some heterosexual activity regarded as normal by them would be closer to rape by our standards. This I got from, I cannot tell you how many nurses from how many different countries in Africa who describe this kind of sexual activity. I do happen to think that the statement about men in Africa taking their women in a brutal way implies that men in the United States do not do that and speaks in to... In a lesser number, Excuse they do. me. We don't know that since one-third of women will be raped in their lifetime and we don't know what happens to the other third, two-thirds. We don't want to, to uh, c continue with the fear that's, that's not in, in a place that's founded, but we certainly want to give people a chance to make informed decisions based on what we do know, not based on what we don't know and what we think might be out there. It's what we do know. And we do know that there are cases of women who have become infected with this virus that claim they're not IV drug users, claim they're not prostitutes, and claim they haven't had anal sex. And based on that alone, we must say to women, then there's got to be some sort of possibility. And until we know further, I want you to know all the real data that's there. It's a different point of view. I really am convinced from all the people I've talked to and all the work that I have gone over that I am not on the wrong track. When I walked out of there, I thought I, there's never been a better decision made. This man has absolutely no concern for the, you know, the, the really horrific potential risk he's putting women in. It confirmed that he didn't know anything. Um, it confirmed that he was doing it for his own ends, whatever they are, uh, probably his own ego. Um, and I think it also made the group coalesce more because we all felt the power of sitting there and being able to each one play off the other one and each of us knew like a different tactic to take. And one of the things that was really nice about Cosmopolitan in, in ACT UP and in the AIDS crisis as a whole, it's really hard to pinpoint the blame and to say that, you know, someone isn't doing their job or they're doing it wrong because there's no one who's really willing to take any responsibility or to be in charge of the AIDS crisis. And the great thing about Cosmopolitan was, you know, here's a magazine with an office in New York with real life people inside who had done something completely wrong. And, uh, you know, they were just sitting there as a target for us and it was very clear, um, you know, what the problem was and what the solution to it was.
The thing to know is that we weren't even a women's committee until the organizing of this demonstration. Originally, in the very beginning, we were a bunch of lesbians who had these dyke dinners, and we would sit around trying to figure out why we were involved with AIDS activism at all. The women's committee started with a group of five or six women, and when the Cosmo organizing started, all of a sudden, all these great women, both gay and straight, were there doing everything that needed to be done. Well, do we have a full horn? It's gonna come. Who's picking up the stuff from Alan? Tom Williams, yes. I'm, uh, I'm picking the stuff up. that Hearst Corporation owns Cosmopolitan Magazine and Cosmo just ran probably one of the worst AIDS articles on women which basically says that if you're a heterosexual woman, even if you're sleeping with a guy who's infected, you're safe, you're not at risk. You know, we'd go up, we'd say that we wanted to go inside, we'd get pushed away by the goons from Cosmopolitan. Um, then we would like go right back and say, you know, we'd like to get in to make an appointment. And then the police would come over and they'd say, you're blocking the door. He said we were blocking the door. We told him no. The goons were blocking the door. And if they would get out of the way, we would get into the building. <laughs> Every time that the, the police would um, try to confront us that we were doing something illegal, we would tell them we weren't, weren't, and we would take their badge numbers down. And they were getting really, really antsy. <laughs> And I started taking his badge number again. <laughs> he got so furious, he started yelling at me. This is the fourth time today you have taken my number. And I said, I know, we just have to know. Like, each thing that you do, we have to document. <laughs> but then he really got pissed, and he started really pushing on us very, very hard. I was torn in a way because as being in, in the organizing process, I wanted to be part of the demonstration, but when you have a camera in your hand, you've got to also think about documenting. So, so part of you has to be cool. And frankly, at that point, I lost my cool. So we're seeing, you see a lot of my feet in, in the rough footage because my hands were up in the air and I was chanting along with everybody else. See, when we were in control, things went well. When we lost control was afterwards, when the media got control of the event, and we lost our representation. Uh, up until then, we had been representing ourselves. I was, in, I was in on the organizing, I was documenting it, so our, we had control of our image. The next day at WOR was exactly the opposite. I'd just like to point out that 1,000 people with AIDS right now, or 1,000 women with AIDS right now, does not reflect how many women are infected. These, it, it takes at least five years, it seems, for people to start showing signs. That, that, that There could be somewhere not around... Not at least five years, but during the course of the... It could be up to it five years. It could be years. up to five years, and it's in, in up to five years, know, it's about 30% of the, of the but people... But some of those cases would show up during those five years, wouldn't they? Some of them, but less than 30%, and that's very much documented. I would like to know why this person, who is not at all an expert, has never dealt with people with with AIDS is allowed to be up here telling us and telling women, particularly the women that read Cosmopolitan between the ages of 15 and 23, that they don't have to tell their lovers to use a condom. It's hard enough to get them to use one anyway. Is a woman at risk th through heterosexual intercourse? Uh, Richard, she is specifically at risk from having panels like this, virtually all panels. I, mean, I asked you a question, Chris. Talking about is, women and AIDS. I asked you a question. Are men. All right, please thank you. Any questions over here? Stand up, please, ma'am. Yes. If Dr. Kiyosha says that it's, about it's being spread heterosexually, then how does he account that in Las Vegas, where they have legalized prostitution? All right. Can we have security guards in here, please? Thank you. I can see. I can see that. I can see that your side believes in the exchange of ideas. I can. That is very well demonstrated. This is an idea. The idea is that women should represent them own selves in talking about AIDS. Both these men have given so much dangerous information to the wonderful, vibrant, alive women in this room and the wonderful, vibrant, alive women in your audience that to go on like this is really dangerous to people's lives. Are you a medical doctor? Three years I can see you're a propagandist. Are you a medical doctor? Are you a medical doctor? 
Three years. I can see you're a propagandist. Are you a medical doctor? Are you a medical doctor? Three years. I can see you're a propagandist. Are you a medical doctor? Okay. I can see the people in our audience believe in the exchange of ideas. Excuse me, Deborah. I'm going to have to escort you back here. It doesn't have to be a woman on the panel. All right. Denise is an RN. She can be on the panel, but there must be. We're not going to allow you to produce the show. One of the problems that we have hysteria in this country is that people like this do not want the exchange of information. They don't know what the ideas to go back and forth. We're going to take a commercial break right now. We'll be right back. At least WOR, we, we were able to, to tear the place apart. Um, Nightline was a totally different fiasco because we were completely invisible. Can you believe they put this entire show on and never even mentioned the protest? We'll talk to the author, to one of his critics, and to Cosmopolitan editor Helen Gurley Brown tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. We are simply saying, be careful, use condoms. No, you're not Don't saying have that. You're not saying that. I read well, that the article the, very carefully. It, it says if you want to be absolutely, totally, beyond any will. shadow of a doubt, but you don't really have to do that. That's, I mean, the article does the not article say use does. condoms. Just respond, if you would, Dr. Krim, to the point that Dr. Gould was making, that if you're going to raise research money, the way to do it is, is to leave the impression correctly or otherwise, that the entire universe is, is capable of being infected. Yes, I find that statement deeply offensive to somebody like me because uh, my intent is not to fool the public to raise money. It's really what I do and what I say is done with great concern for the, new, the young generation. I, don't, I want them to stop dying. I think that none of us... Um knew that Dr. Gould then would also be on the Phil Donahue show and that the Phil Donahue producers would make sure that uh, four of us who were identifiable at the, the talk show that where we were thrown out would be put on a list and forbidden from being in that studio audience to refute Dr. Gould. When Winkelstein and Patian did their study of women who did get AIDS, <laughs> asked them how many of you had anal intercourse 60% admitted it, and that doesn't include the others who don't want to admit it. Though we kind of broke the story that women could be killed from this kind of information, we were then made invisible, and the only thing that was left was a debate about epidemiological truth, and whether or not so-and-so is a doctor, and whether or not there is proof that there is heterosexual transmission, irrespective of the fact that women have AIDS. My name is Jennifer Bensinger. I'm an NYU student, part of the Student AIDS Coalition there. And I read the Cosmopolitan article, and it appalled me. I thought it was a bunch of lies, and if the printing of it could cost lives. So I called the Department of Health and the AIDS Project coordinator there, and the research people wrote a letter to Cosmopolitan. They tried to call Cosmopolitan and didn't get very much response, so they wrote letters. And now we're here to stop people from killing each other by printing lies. I think this will let us broaden the issues. And I think, I hope that it'll also allow us to support other women who are working on um, AIDS issues and that they'll know that we're there as a resource and they can call on us f um, when they have things that they think uh, maybe a direct action needs to be taken about. Everybody who is affected by AIDS has to be out here fighting about it. Um, if we section off into gay men and women and minorities and black men and black men, if everyone is separated, we're all going to fail. The only way for us to uh, really change the way AIDS is handled in this country is for all of us to work together. So, you know, their lives are my life. I'm glad that the uh, AIDS community joined in with this, but we've got, we need to have a whole other world join in with this, and that's the you know, 15-year-old girls that are becoming sexually active that don't think they're at risk, and that's just not true. As a group, we brought something to act up by the women organizing together. Even though we started out almost really as a gripe group about ACT UP, um, it was just completely a positive experience. And, you know, I think it really, there was a lot of trust and a lot of, um, 
feeling that we were really onto something and that we were, you know, that we were really going to go someplace and do a lot of good work. My fantasy is that things don't stop here and that um, more women in the group will feel comfortable taking the camera and bringing it to places where things are happening and documenting their own lives. Because as women have been saying for, for years now, what's personal is political. And our personal lives are a microcosm in a way of what's going on in the entire political scene. So it's very important to me that this happen. And I want the camera to be there when, when when uh, any of these actions are happening and I want these women to be in the editing room to um, sort of restructure and represent their own history and that's really important to me. So I think it's particularly significant that women are as involved as they are, who, who, that they know the issues and that they're willing, as we were, to take anybody on who says that we are stupid, that we are animals, that we don't deserve information, and that we should be killed. Because all of us said no. Let her go! 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 Thank you for joining us, and until next time, remember, resist.